uh, David Dalsbrook, you in your written uh, co consultation submission, uh, you raised this issue and uh, I believe you pointed out that uh, the collective was yet to distribute $53 million. Uh, so I'd like to hear from you first uh, about why you think uh, that that's a problem and wh what you think is wrong with the way money is being divvied up. And then, uh, of course, uh, Mr. Baskin, you'll have the chance to uh, explain your yourself. Well, to I don't really mean to say it's wrong. I just mean to say I, I was talking about the there are sort of three different schemes for regulating copyright collectives in the Copyright Act, which makes it complex. And what are they? And uh, well, there is uh, one the one that governs you, uh, which has the Copyright Board fixing tariffs. There's one that allows collectives to file a, a license agreement with the Copyright Board for review by the Competition Commissioner. And uh, there's a third one uh, which eludes me for the moment. Uh, Those aren't three different regimes. Those are three different types of activity. First of all, the private copying regime is not a copyright matter. It's a right of remuneration, which means that we cannot independently set the rate by the way of negotiation. There's nobody to negotiate with. Secondly, the licensing of songs for reproduction on CDs or via the internet can happen either by way of agreement or by way of collective. This was the scheme introduced and in if 1988. It's, it's not a matter of copyright. The federal government doesn't have any jurisdiction to levy the levy, so I'm surprised you would say that. No, the levy, the opportunity to collect the levy was created in Part 8 of the Copyright Act in the 1997 amendments. There's nobody with whom the value of that levy could be negotiated. There is no licensee, as there is in the case of, of CDs or internet distribution. Right. The only way it can be determined is by a quasi-judicial body, or I suppose the courts, mm -hmm. or parliament if they wanted to do it right. that way. Somebody has to decide. Mm -hmm. And therefore, the value of the private copying levy is determined by the board. I don't really know who else could do it. I don't think you'd like it if we did it unilaterally. David, maybe well, you could explain exactly sure, how you determine to. who receives uh, payment. Well, the first thing to know is that we don't and we can't ask people what they copy. And even in the surveys where we've looked into that question, people just don't have good recollection of what they copy. You can't use that as a criterion. And we're not asking people to fill out forms to tell us what they copied. That would be stupid. Instead, we start with the proposition that there is at least a some relationship between what's popular and what's likely to get copied. And how do you determine what is popular? There are two primary sources of, of usage information. One of them is airplay data, what songs have been broadcast. And one of them is sales data, what songs have been sold by way of sale of CDs and downloads. And we pool that data, and since it's basically impossible to say whether airplay or sales has a greater influence in determining what is copied, we take half the proceeds and distribute them on the basis of what gets sold, in other words, pro rata distribution, and the other half on the basis of airplay. Now, it takes time to accumulate the data. For instance, we won't know the 2009 airplay data until the surveys are completed and available in 2010. Likewise, we won't have comprehensive sales data for 2009 until 2010. It takes roughly a year to get the distribution completed. We're never, we're never behind, if you will, any more than the previous year's data and have been since the beginning. As a matter of fact, CPCC has distributed the money faster than any other similar collective in the world. And frankly, I'm surprised at the critical remarks in the paper you filed with the, uh, with the consultative process. Did you talk to us? Well, I've got your financial sure. statement here, which says you took in, in 2007, about uh, 20, $32 million. Mm -hmm. And you had, at the time, available for distribution, about $50 million. That's right. So you had about a year and a half's worth of money? That's right, that? because the process is time-consuming to determine who's entitled to pay, unless you think okay. there should simply be an arbitrary distribution of money at random. No, no, I'm not saying there's anything the wrong with it. What I'm here is wrongdoing. Well, Why would you have uh, gone out of your way? Well, that would be critical. Um, what I'm trying to say is, first of all, there are criticisms to level at other collectives. Secondly, if I were a member of your collective, I would want to know why there's such a ta time lag and why it's not possible to forecast what your income is going to be, give out 80% of it as you go along, and adjust it that way. Why 18 months in arrears? I, I, that's hard for me to understand. But well, I've no just explained to you, it takes yeah. time to get the money out. The danger with paying out money on the basis of advances and assumptions is that the data doesn't necessarily show it. Did you know 12 months ago Lady Gaga would be a hit? I didn't. I don't think you did. It's a little difficult to tell you who's going to be number one on the charts at any given time. Our data, the data on which we distribute is based on actual information about sales and airplay. Mm -hmm. And as Ray Charles said, ain't no one can predict a hit. I see. So you're, you're saying it just takes 18 months to, it takes, to it accumulate takes the information you need to make your It takes the information isn't available until the following yeah. year. I see. Okay. 
Okay. Well, that's a reasonable wanna, explanation. I want to bring Justin in uh, to this. So, mm -hmm. Justin, uh, students, I think, are known as uh, being on the leading edge of technology. And certainly students would, uh, you know, you would think they would be used to taking something in one format, shifting it to a d different format, whether, say, it's a song that's on a CD they want to load onto their iPods, or, as you mentioned, with your example, putting a, a lecture onto your iPod. Yeah. Um, now, are students even aware that they're, uh, they are paying a levy for, um, on uh, these blank CDs, for example? I, I, would, I would wager the guess that um, not just uh, students, but in general, the public doesn't, isn't aware that they uh, actually pay this levy. And I, I thought one of the recommendations from uh, David's proposal, which was really interesting, was to actually make it so that when this levy is paid that it has to be uh, actually put onto the, the packaging that that levy is being, that levy is going forward. Because I think, uh, as was mentioned, it's something that people don't know about. And then, um, no offense to the uh, Canadian Private Copying Collective, but when th there is a public consultation, and but people don't know about even the concept of the levy, it, it's hard to ask people for feedback about something they don't even know about they're actually paying. Well, come on so now. People have an obligation to at least find out about the subject. First of all, CPCC's website is by a long way more informative where, where than anybody. Where do people have an obligation? They, they go to the store, they pay their money for a CD, and there's, there's nothing, nothing on the, the act, receipt. There's nothing in the says, act that bars any manufacturer or retailer from doing just that. As a matter of fact, you may have at some point or another been in Western Canada and visited a London drugs outlet. They're mm -hmm. a very major chain. They have signage in every one of their stores with the details of the levy. Mm -hmm. There's nothing stopping any retailer from doing that. There's nothing stopping any manufacturer or importer from putting that information on his package. Similar to, gas, similar to, gasoline, similar to gasoline companies that put stickers right. on the gas things that say this much of your money is going to taxes. We don't hide what we're doing. Our website is very comprehensive. The Copyright Act is a public document. It's not on the receipt. It's not on the packaging. Because it's People not are paying not, you money no, the and they have no idea that they are. Well, in that case, and you they say they should themselves. find your website to find out where their money is going? No, I said if they want to know about the levy, they should ask us. Why you particularly, as opposed to that guy over there? How are people well, going to know that? Why shouldn't it be on the receipt? <laughs> I, I just think that it's it's one of those situations where, and I'm, and I'm not trying to be attacking when I say this, but it's one of those situations where, um, if you don't know you're paying a fee, it's hard to take on the burden of actually going out and finding out about the fee. And I, and I don't mean that to to try to provoke anything. I'm just saying that. At current, if it's up to the up to the people who are selling the discs uh, to actually put that up there, if they're not putting it up up for people to see, the consumer who's going into the store to purchase something would have no idea that they even have to go and find something out. That's the all. The tenor of your discussion is that we have hidden information. We have done nothing of that sort. It's all out there in public for anyone who is interested to find out about it. So I'm the press spokesman for CPCC. Mm -hmm. There isn't a reporter's question I have turned down in a decade. David, if, there, mm -hmm. if the uh, levy were to be extended to other forms mm -hmm. of media, would there be uh, any other efforts you think required to uh, inform people of that? Well, the people who pay the levy are the people who import the products first and foremost. And I think you can be uh, more than certain on the basis of past experience that if we succeeded in getting this onto the agenda, there would be a fair amount of press attention. There has been in the past. I've done hundreds of interviews okay, with CPCC. So, so you would rely on the press then to make, uh, to make the public awareness? Well, first of all, the, po the Copyright Board is a public process, and what we do is a public process. Nothing is being hidden from anybody. You know. Okay, very good. D well, David, what would you like to see done? Well, how about spending a little bit of your royalty income to just put a message out there saying thank you for your money. We appreciate your encouragement of the arts. Well, why don't you spend some money to tell me thank you for allowing me to make copies legally? Come on now. That's because not if, the way business works. If you're, if you're my client, I thank you for my business. Well, that's swell, perhaps. And you know you've got a bill from me. Whereas if I go to Staples and buy a CD, I don't know I've had a bill from you. Look. And I don't know I've paid to enrich copyright. Yeah. I think I'm making illegal copies in the back. Because well, nobody's sorry, told uninformed. me. The bottom line is that our surveys show, month after month after month, that Canadians believe it is fair for artists to be compensated for the use of their work and they think mm -hmm. a levy is fair. And when we have asked people, what amount do you think it is fair? They have, time and again, average recommendations far higher than we have ever sought on anything. You're talking about 29 cents a disc to copy mm -hmm. a very large amount of music. You know, in an MP3 compressed, for compressed format, mm -hmm. you can get hundreds of songs on a disc, easily over 100, even at a fairly modest level of compression for a 29 cent levy. I'm what talking, exactly is your problem? My problem is twofold. One is the scheme was created 
in recognition of the fact that all this illegal copying was going to no, go the on scheme anyway. Is created because people value the copies that are made, and this returns value to the people who create the music. The scheme was created at a time, frankly, before the internet was even available to all but a handful of academic researchers or perhaps the military. When the scheme was created, it was created in the context of cassette recording. And it recognizes that songs and performances have value. And when you copy those onto a CD for your personal private use, it's fair to compensate the people who create the music for the use of that music. That's all, right. all it's about. You announced earlier that it was illegal to make those copies at that time. That's right. And maybe it wasn't, maybe it wasn't. But the fact is that this scheme has converted what you say was a massive illegal activity into a legal one. Yes. But you haven't told anybody it's legal. So they're still doing it. Now they're paying for it, Look, and they we still can't, think we they're can't breaking the law. We can't be responsible for, uh, for curing a state of ignorance that exists to whatever degree you say, that you, you say does. 